Hello, and welcome to this session that we have with Alfred Bubba Cook to talk about IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Alfred Bubba Cook has spent a lifetime on the ocean and for the last 19 years has worked in fisheries conservation and management. At age 18, he joined the United States Navy nuclear power program, which took him around the world and sparked an interest in global affairs and especially international fisheries. Troubled by fishery declines he observed at home and abroad, he sought out an education focused on fisheries policy and law. In 2000, he received a Bachelor's of Science degree in fisheries and aquaculture from Texas A&M University, followed in 2003 by a Judas Doctorate or a law degree with a certificate in natural policy, resource policy and environmental law from Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon making him well suited to take on complex policy initiatives in large scale fisheries. After law school, he was hired by the US National Marine Fisheries Service in Alaska, where he led a dedicated team in the implementation of one of the world's most complex and effective fishery management programs for the North Pacific crab fishery made famous by the TV show, The Deadliest Catch. He later joined the Worldwide, the worldwide Fund for Nature's WWF's Arctic program to support fisheries conservation and management efforts across the Bering Sea from the Russian Far East to Alaska's remote indigenous communities. In 2010, he joined the US Peace Corps and served in Wailevu village in Vanua Levu, Fiji, where he supported several grassroots marine conservation projects over two years. Since 2012, Bubba has worked as the Western and Region and Central Pacific Tuna Program Manager for WWF out of Suva, Fiji and Wellington, New Zealand where he focuses on improving tuna fisheries management at a national and regional level in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean through policy improvements, market tools, and technological innovation. Through his role with WWF, Bubba has enthusiastically supported the development of technology solutions for difficult fisheries challenges, including supporting the execution of international events designed to explore and promote new technologies, such as unmanned vehicle systems and blockchain for application in fisheries conservation contexts. Thank you so very much for joining us today, Baba. We look forward to hearing what you have to say about how each of us, you know, learning more about IUU fishing and how each of us can play a role in promoting sustainability. So thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Becca. And I really appreciate the opportunity to, to come and talk to you guys today. Um, all right. Well, Thank you very much again, Becca, for allowing me to uh, join you guys today and, and share a little bit about WWF's work in uh, ocean conservation and, and fisheries with respect to illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and, um, and some of the steps that we can all take as individuals and as consumers to help uh, drive better fisheries and, and improve our environment um, in the long run. So. I'd, I'd like to start by um, uh, talking about a, a little bit about who we are and, and what we do and how we do it and why. Uh, talk about some of the challenges facing our, our oceans and then address some of the things we can all do uh, to help make our world a better place where we can all live in harmony with nature, uh, which is part of WWS mission. So, uh, our patron saint, David Attenborough, astutely stated in his most recent films, A Life on This Planet, that humanity has reached a point where it considers itself apart from nature rather than a part of nature. Uh, WWF's vision is a, a reflection of that statement and that we hope to see a future where humanity lives in harmony with nature. Our mission, more simply, is to protect and restore our natural world um, to a state where species and habitats thrive and and people can enjoy those, those uh, same elements. Consistent with our vision, uh, we recognize that we must work with humanity to solve these problems. So that means working with a diversity of stakeholders to develop scientific and evidence-based solutions that can be driven from communities upwards. So WWF was founded in 1961 with a focus on wilderness preservation and the reduction of human impact on the environment. Uh, our auspicious founders included Sir Julian Huxley, a renowned naturalist and father of the famous author Aldous Huxley, and Sir Peter Scott, son of Antarctic explorer Robert Scott, as well as Dutch Prince Bernhard of Lippenbisterfield and the late Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Each of them witnessed conspicuous declines in the natural world during their lifetimes and, and sought to, to do something about it. I'm sorry. 
Uh, in the 1960s, it all started with funding for small isolated projects, and mostly through the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, and in the 70s and 80s, our, our work expanded with the recognition that animals don't observe human boundaries. They tend not to follow lines on a map. And that a more broad and methodical cross-border approach uh, was required to protect many species. Then in the 90s, uh, it brought the recognition of rapid consumption and depletion of natural resources and that markets play a key role in conservation of those resources. Uh, that decade saw the advent of the Forest Stewardship Council and the Marine Stewardship Council, which were both uh, developments that the, the, the uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature supported and, and, um, and implemented. Then in the 2000s, uh, our work expanded many of the market-based approaches with an eye towards systemic impact. And through the advent of the internet and the information revolution, WWF started down a path of support, supporting innovative approaches through technology in support of transparency, traceability, and at the end of the day, accountability uh, across the, the supply chain that provides humanity. And so you can see on the screen, there's a number of different approaches that we take uh, to addressing these complex conservation and management problems. And it ranges everywhere from food to, to water to climate and energy. Uh, and the, the broad recognition of this is that all of these things are, are interconnected and we have a responsibility to address them all collectively. And you can see on the screen here, this is our theory of change. And WWF works uh, in all these areas, but we, of course, will be focusing on these you, you see circled on the screen today. So today I'm focusing on the oceans only because it's my area of expertise, but the theory of change can apply across all of these groups and any of the commodities that have an impact uh, within or, or on them. Uh, we know that when consumers are, are better informed, they tend to make better choices about the products that they buy, which can have a profound impact on the production system. So we work to leverage that information in favor of conservation by direct and indirect influence on the, in the governance realm, uh, as well as through advocacy and outreach in the markets. The end goal is to move markets and move humanity towards more sustainable and ethical practices. So at the end of the day, because humans are a part of nature, uh, we seek a future in which we as humanity live in harmony with each other and with nature. And so our mission is really to, to help stop the degradation of planet and, and start moving back towards an environment where we don't have any more extinction, uh, we reduce our footprint, and we start to rebuild some of what we destroyed over recent decades. So globally, WWF uses three methods to achieve conservation impact. Um, what you see on the screen here uh, it represents just a few of the, the methods that we, we use. And the first is delivering field-based solutions. And an example of that might be the electronic reporting tools that, that we've supported for Pacific fishing vessels and the parties to the Nauru Agreement, or the Seafood and Fisheries Emerging Technologies Conferences, where we've brought in people from all over the Pacific and around the world to learn about various technology tools that are available for addressing IUU fishing on the high seas. We also work to transform markets. And this includes partnerships with industry to improve practices. For instance, the work that we engage with the uh, Fiji Fisheries Industry Association, uh, the tuna fleets that operate out of Suva, as well as the, the Marine Stewardship Council that I mentioned earlier, which is a third party certification that helps to ensure sustainability uh, in fisheries and, and promote sustainable products in the markets. And the last is, is science-based policy and our efforts to contribute scientific studies and advocate for best practice policies, such as uh, a legal and policy analysis that we put before the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, uh, or uh, encouraging civil society organizations, such as the Pacific uh, Council of Churches, uh, to engage in some of the uh, public meetings across the Pacific. And so, you know, why do we do it? And we have to recognize that, that, you know, fisheries are an important part of a healthy global economy. 
uh, even our, our small villages, you know, depend on fish within the, the community to trade for, for other items. Um, and, uh, you know, we recognize that, um, uh, you know, that these fisheries supply an important resource for the entire world. So fish is an important low cost protein resource, both at the local level, all the way up to the global level. Um, we, we also, you know, want to ensure that uh, we have well managed and sustainable fisheries because we know that that ultimately is going to supply fish to our markets. But there's plenty of people to speak on behalf of fishermen and, and you know, the markets that they supply and, and the government's interested in ensuring those fisheries are available. But at the end of the day, there's not very many people who can speak on behalf of the fish or who can speak on behalf of nature. And that's an important role that we, we play is, is speaking on the, like the, the Lorax from uh, the Dr. Seuss book, someone has to speak for the trees. In our case, we're speaking for the fish. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of perspective on, on the, the uh, world that we work within. And you can see on the screen here, this is a representation of the Western and Central Pacific uh, Ocean region and the EEZs that belong to the various countries within the region. And you can see that it's a, it's, it's a significantly large area and that there's a, a, a lot of different countries that live and uh, or exist and, and have responsibility over these areas. So the responsibility for collectively managing the, the fishery falls to the Regional Fisheries Management Organization or the RFMO uh, known as the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission or WCPFC. And you can see again that this is a huge area of responsibility uh, it's literally millions uh, of square kilometers. It goes all the way from Pitcairn Island to the western coast of Australia, Indonesia, and the Philippines and Japan, all the way up to the Aleutian Islands. So it's it's an enormous area of responsibility, and and uh, you know it has a, a lot of different uh, state actors within it. And so what you see on the screen here represented is, is the nested nature of responsibility for fisheries management within the region. At the broadest level, which was a, a UN designated um, level is the Regional Fisheries Management Organization or the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission. Then within that you, you have, uh, for instance, the uh, Pacific Islands Forum, which would be a regional organization that has responsibility over marine resources at some level. Then within that, you had the sub-regional organizations, which would include uh, such as the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency, which is within the Pacific Islands Forum, or the parties to the Nauru Agreement, which is a treaty organization among uh, six of the uh, Pacific Island nations to manage the, uh, particularly the purse seine tuna fishery. And then of course, within all of that, you have the national governments responsible for all of the activities within their EEZs, uh, to ensure that fisheries are sustainably, sustainably managed within the, the boundaries of each of those countries. So I wanted to be able to give a little bit of perspective about why fisheries are important and how important they are to the Pacific. Um, in, particularly in, in this um, part of the world, you know, they are an incredibly important resource, not just for ecological reasons, but for economic reasons and for cultural reasons. So all of those statistics that I'm going to share with you today come from a uh, Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission tuna fisheries yearbook that's produced by the Secretary of the Pacific Community every year. And uh, the first thing I want to share is just that, you know, a huge amount of tuna comes from the Pacific and, uh, and nearly 3 million tons harvested in 2020. That amounts to approximately 250,000 city buses worth of tuna from the, the Western Central Pacific Ocean that was caught just last year. So if you can imagine uh, 250,000 of the buses you see in Suva uh, at any one time, uh, that's the amount of tuna that comes out of the Pacific Ocean on an annual basis. Now, the next slide I'd like to, to share is just the, the number of uh, fishing vessels that are listed to that fish within the Western Central Pacific region. And you, know, you can see that there's a, a, a huge number of, of vessels that, that work in the region, but we have to also acknowledge that the majority of the volume of, 
uh, uh, fish is actually captured by the uh, Persane fleet, which is only 481 vessels. Um, and to give you a little bit of an indication of just uh, how many um, vessels uh, are fishing in the region that are from outside the region, uh, the number of Taiwanese vessels, uh, just the longline fleet, are, is about 640 vessels right now. So uh, there's a, a huge amount of effort that comes in from outside the Pacific Islands region. And that's a result of, of many reasons uh, that, you know, in some cases, Pacific Islands like, say, Tokelau or Nauru simply don't have ports as facilities to support their own domestic fleets. Um, but also the fact that there is a huge interest from um, uh, the distant water fishing nations or DWFNs uh, to, uh, to exploit resources from the region. And so the total value of the fisheries estimated last year, and this is the landed value, so this doesn't include any processing, this is just the raw fish that, that comes to shore, is $7 billion. And that uh, figure is expected to rise consistently year on year. So there's a huge amount of revenue that's generated from the fisheries in the Western and Central Pacific region. And this is a, a, a big number, but to help try and put it in perspective, uh, a simplistic calculation would show roughly $2 million uh, US dollars per vessel um, if the catch were distributed evenly across the entire fishing fleet. Now, obviously that's, that's a, a bit of a generalization and there's some vessels that, that make more and some vessels that make less, uh, but it is an indication of how profitable the fishery can be. Now, it's much harder to quantify the, the ecological and economic losses or foregone economic opportunity from other aspects of the fishery, such as, as bycatch. Now, this has a, uh, the fisheries may target a certain species, but they inevitably catch other species because in many cases, the, the gear that they use is indiscriminate. So we lose things like albatross or sea turtles, you know, vonu, uh, or in gio, you know, like our sharks. Um, and we, you know, we have a responsibility um, both as humanity, but just as, as good stewards to ensure that uh, we're, we're accounting for, for that loss and that we're recognizing that loss and doing what we can to reverse that loss. So I wanna talk a little bit about the threats that each of, um, that our, our oceans face and, and, um, and each of their respective uh, uh, angles and, and how that impacts um, our, our ocean health and what we can do ultimately to address that. So uh, our, our oceans and the fisheries that, um, that they support uh, face numerous threats. And the first threat is overfishing. Uh, nearly 80% of the world's fisheries are already fully exploited, overexploited, depleted, or in a state of collapse. Uh, worldwide, 90% of the stocks of large predatory fish, such as sharks, uh, tuna, marlin, and swordfish have disappeared. And this is driven increased by an increasingly global marketplace and an exponential demand for seafood caused by a growing world population coupled with changing cultural tastes for seafood. And you know, we have fishing vessels that are as technologically advanced as some spacecraft uh, with satellite positioning, radar, sonar, and other electronics that help them target fish more effectively than ever. And if you look at the image uh, in the upper right, it looks like the bridge of a, a spacecraft. That could be the Starship Enterprise, but it's actually a fishing vessel. And that is an indication of just how sophisticated some of these fishing vessels are these days. But we have more fishing power than ever before where we're able to catch far more fish with much less effort than ever in history. And to give you some perspective, um, you know, th this is a, a, a picture that you see below in the, the lower right hand corner of a trawl vessel, which you know uses a, a, a huge net to uh, drag through the water column or in some cases across the bottom and catch you know, hundreds of thousands of tons in the course of a, a fishing season. So meanwhile, while technology is making it easier, easier than ever to target fish, it's actually becoming harder than ever to catch those fish compared to the the effort expended because of stock declines and reductions in fish populations. Unfortunately, uh, some governments are, are struggling to, to rein in this expansion of, of fishing power around the globe, 
um, and in some cases have actually added insult to injury through subsidies that make it profitable to keep fishing when it would otherwise be uneconomical. So this overfishing is also driven by other factors that I'll describe in the next slides. So overfishing is both facilitated and exacerbated by illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, or IUU, which includes all fishing that breaks fisheries laws and, and regulations or occurs outside their reach, more or less. So illegal fishing usually means fishing without a license in an area where fishing is banned uh, or with prohibited gear uh, over a quota or uh, even for protected species. Very often it's a, a vessel entering a nation's waters with no fishing license or fishing with a license but catching more than it's allowed. <clears throat> Unreported fishing includes that catch which is either not reported or is misreported in violation of established rules by licensed vessels looking to, for instance, uh, flout quota or catch prohibited species. Uh, unregulated fishing occurs on the high seas where uh, you know, which cover almost 45% of the planet, where patchy regulation and enforcement um, in this area allows for rampant violations. It's not a stretch to describe it as the Wild West, where rules are loose and generally have no teeth. So experts estimate that more than one in five or 22% of landed fish are caught illegally, with this figure rising as high as one in four off of Africa. Every year, an estimated 10 to $24 billion worth of fish is lost to IUU. It also has direct ties to organized crime, including human trafficking, drug smuggling, and slavery. So to get an idea of the incentives or, or possibly the cost versus the benefits of engaging in illegal fishing, the vessel in the upper right-hand corner that you see is case in point. Rather than face consequences for IUU fishing that they were caught being engaged in, the operators of the fishing vessel Thunder, uh, in the image that you see, opted to scuttle their vessels, literally sink their vessel in thousands of meters of water, rather than face the consequences of, of being prosecuted for illegal fishing. The vessel you see below that, the, the uh, Korean vessel uh, Insung 7, you can see attempting to uh, evade capture by the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, it's not uncommon to have these slow speed chases where, you know, the uh, Coast Guards or local authorities have to, you know, chase these vessels at slow speeds for, for many, many kilometers just to catch up with them and, and try and board them and prosecute them. Nonetheless, I, I really should note that the patently eye or illegal fishing is an increasingly small proportion of the problem, thanks to global efforts to address the issue through technology like satellite monitoring. Uh, but the U of unreported or misreported catch makes up the largest proportion of IUU and coincidentally is something that some of you, uh, you know, here in this room uh, may have, uh, you know, some understanding of and it's, it's an issue that, um, you know, we, we all need to try and address and ensuring that uh, the fishing vessels that operate within our respective countries are reporting what they are indeed catching. So the, the last threat I'm going to address, and, and there's certainly others that I could address um, related to, to human and labor rights, but we'll have to leave that for a, another day. Uh, but supply chain waste and fraud is, is an additional driver for IUU and overfishing. A, a 2015 study estimates that every year, almost 50 million tons of seafood is wasted. Uh, with some recommendations that the average person should consume at least 50 grams of protein a day, this lost seafood is enough to feed more than 2.7 million people for an entire year. In some cases, as much as 90% of what goes into a fresh fish counter ends up as waste, and that's a tragedy for a lot of reasons. Uh, when that fish becomes waste, it further contributes to overfishing as fishermen and markets try to make up the difference and, and meet the, man, the demand for fresh fish. So as, as consumers, um, we're typically drawn more to fresh fillets and, and other fresh uh, fish that's kept on ice and, and seafood markets and, than we are to packaged and frozen, frozen seafood. Um, I, I think, you know, in the, in the case of the Pacific, uh, generally seafood waste is, is really minimal. Uh, as, as anyone who's lived in, 
in Fiji or some of the other Pacific Islands, uh, nothing generally goes to waste. But there are advantages to buying packaged and, and frozen fish that's shelf stable in some cases, like tin fish, which you know you don't have to worry about refrigerating. Um, but you know, making sure that you use the entire fish and and not waste anything because every fish wasted is another fish that has to be caught to replace that wasted fish. And uh, and so we want to make sure that we use as, as much of the fish as as possible uh, when we're we're eating fish for our fish dinner. Um, so regardless of, of, of these issues, you know, there are things that, that we can do that should be good for the environment uh, for multiple reasons, including less greenhouse gases that result from fish waste rotting in landfills, in addition to the incentive uh, for overfishing. And there are practical consumers that we can, uh, practical steps and solutions that we can take as, as consumers. Um, for instance, you know, we can eat the, the various uh, uh, other products from, from fish uh, different than just the fillets or the, the, the steaks, such as collars, cubes, or smaller offset pieces. And, and Pacific pokey is a very popular, um, uh, popular food, as well as uh, kokonda. And, um, and I know I'm very fond of kokonda myself, and that's one way to use the entire fish. Um, some of you may or may not have seen the, the recent article and the, the last part of this, uh, this slide I want to address is, is seafood fraud. Uh, so some of you may have seen the, the Guardian article recently that described an analysis of 44 recent studies of more than 9,000 seafood samples from restaurants, fishmongers, and supermarkets in more than 30 countries that found that 36% were mislabeled. Um, exposing seafood fraud on a vast global scale. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I don't like to be lied to. Um, I, I want to know that what I'm buying is, is what they say it is. So when seafood is fraudulently mislabeled, not only are the unscrupulous sellers duping consumers into buying a lower value product than uh, for a higher price, but by depressing the, the market for that product, they cause the fishermen that uh, legitimately harvest that species to make less and therefore have to catch more to make up the difference. Again, uh, further exacerbating uh, overfishing. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the solutions and, um, you know, we always talk about, uh, you know, thinking globally but acting locally. And there are always things that we can each individually do to help improve the, the situation. And, um, you know, there's a lot of tools in the toolbox that we can bring uh, to the, the table. And I've been fortunate in that I've been able to, to work across several different levels. And, and uh, uh, I'm very proud of my Peace Corps service uh, in Fiji, where I served in, in Walevo Koro and Vano Levo. And, uh, you know, some of the toolbox uh, tools that, that we would use are just simple, good fisheries management and enforcement. And uh, you can see in, in a few of the pictures there in the, the lower left-hand corner uh, of me working with one of the Dangolis, uh, Elima Rambuli in uh, Wailevu Koro, where we're learning how to use a, a type of gear that would be more selective and better suited for catching uh, larger fish outside the reef to help preserve the, the integrity of the, the reef and shore. And above that picture, you know, a village development meeting where we were talking about establishing um, a, a marine permanent marine protected area um, in the region to ensure that that um, you know the the environment was protected and preserved uh, offshore the, of the area. Um, this village development meeting also included the the local church, and uh, you know we were very thankful to have the. Uh, Tala Talangasi there, uh, who came out and blessed the area uh, after establishing the, the marine protected area. And so it's been uh, very well received and very well respected in the village. So marine protected areas as a, as a management tool are, are very important in ensuring the health of, of our local environments. But when you take something away, you should always give something back in return. And so we did uh, a number of business development projects in the region. And one of those business development projects was led by my wife, um, who we were serving together there, and she was able to establish a virgin coconut oil cooperative um, in the village. Um, you can see in the uh, images uh, in the upper right hand corner, uh, uh, Ambassador Frankie Reed from the US Embassy came to visit 
And she got to see firsthand the, the virgin coconut oil operation and our sandalwood tree operation, which uh, we were growing sandalwood seedlings, which are a very high value resource. Uh, so we had a, a project for the women and a project for the men. And if you look at the lower right-hand corner of the screen, you can see the marine protected area uh, ghosted in light blue. And it's, it's, it's not a small area. So you know, we wanted to ensure that it provided the adequate level of protection uh, for the, the, the reef and for the, the fisheries resources in that area uh, to ensure a, a, a sustainable um, protection of the, the resource long into the future. And at the same time, providing that economic value to the, the community through the business development projects. And so when you look at the, the uh, global side, and I, I, as I said, I've been privileged to be able to work at a very local level, but also at a, a very much broader level. Um, you have the same tools available. Um, you're just working a, a, across a different environment. And so, you know, you still want to have good fisheries management and enforcement. And so one of the projects that you can see in the lower left-hand corner was implementing uh, electronic reporting tools for the parties to the Nauru Agreement fleet and helping uh, to ensure that we have the best information available coming in so we can properly manage the resources. And then we also engaged in the emerging technologies uh, conferences and events, which I described earlier, which were designed to help bring uh, fishermen and and, uh, and managers and government officials together with technology providers to help find solutions with some of our modern technology to, to be able to support uh, better sustainability and better protection uh, of our resources. Uh, in some cases, for instance, you know, marine protection is, is difficult because it's hard to, to ensure that the boundaries are respected. But when you employ things like the, the drone that you see in the, the picture there and, and other satellite tools and even listening devices, you know, just a, a microphone that you put in the water where you can hear vessels coming into a protected area, uh, which is something that they're doing in New Caledonia, um, can all help serve to protect those areas. Um, and if you look in the, the middle of the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, one of uh, Fiji's native sons, Ken Katafono, who started his own technology company and worked with us to develop the, one of the first blockchain solutions for tracing seafood from bait to plate uh, within the Pacific region. And uh, we were able to show that you could show uh, the path of the fish from uh, a fishing vessel all the way to the consumer and uh, be able to tell the story of that fish and ensure the sustainability of the, the harvest as well. Other aspects include the, and you see in the upper right-hand corner, it's some of the analysis, analyses that we put forward. Um, one of the analyses was a legal, uh, uh, in, in the far right you see was a, a legal analysis that showed that some of the distant water fleets re fishing in the region were actually um, lying to the local authorities uh, about the laws that they said restricted their ability to provide information. And as a result of that analysis, we were able to, for the first time in more than 13 years, get information about uh, some of the fishing that was occurring uh, from those distant water fishing nations in the Pacific uh, that had previously been unreported. And one of the, the things that, that I particularly enjoy being able to do is to fight hard on behalf of the, the resource, but also on the behalf of the Pacific. And in the lower right-hand corner, uh, you can see me rather animated about um, protection of, of fisheries observers in the region. There have been more than 10 uh, fisheries observers over 10 years that have died under uh, mysterious circumstances in the, uh, uh, in the region, many of them Pacific Islanders. And so we were advocating to ensure that fisheries observers receive the protection that, that they deserve and needed so that they could come home to their families at the end of the day. And so, you know, the, the solutions, um, you know, there's always solutions that, that can be employed to help make a difference. And there's things that you can do uh, to help make a difference. And one of those things is, uh, you know, to purchase seafood, you know, that you know where it's from, that you can, you can ensure you know where it's sourced from. And, and if, if it's possible to know that it's sourced sustainably, that they're using methods 
that are environmentally respectful and uh, don't have a negative impact on the environment. Uh, for instance, in some places they use poisons and dynamite to catch fish, which is, is not good for anyone, including the people who eat it. Um, now there's two uh, broader market mechanisms that I mentioned earlier that uh, represent two certifications that can help you make wise seafood choices. And that's the Marine Stewardship Council and the Aquaculture Stewardship Council uh, certifications. Um, in the case of the Pacific, these are difficult certifications to find in the local market. Um, but you know, you, when you're working with your local fishmonger, um, you know, down at the wet market in Suva um, or, you know, in, in Lombasa, where some of the fish shops are, uh, it's good to know your, who your fisherman is and where they're going and understand how they're catching the fish and that they're not having a, a negative impact on the environment. And, and it's one way of kind of achieving, uh, you know, transparency over how your food gets to your plate. And so full bait to plate transparency at the end of the day is the only way to ensure that something is uh, or what something is and where it came from. So consumers, you know, really need to continue to insist on transparent and traceable seafood in support of efforts to eliminate IUU, seafood fraud, human rights violations and other issues in the supply chain. And I think we all want to know where our seafood comes from and how it was produced. Um, WWF has, has led the way supporting innovative approaches to addressing transparency and traceability in, uh, of food, uh, such as through the work with our, our uh, Fiji Fishing Industry Association and Traceable in um, uh, blockchain traceability of, of tuna. So the, the next is, uh, you know, seafood that is, is handled well and, and, uh, and, and taken care of and even frozen shortly after um, being caught, you know, can be an important uh, uh, way to ensure that you use more of the seafood. Um, and, and as I suggested, you know, it's in, in the islands, it's not as important uh, because, you know, you, in the islands, you tend to use all of the, the bits of the fish. And so thinking outside the, the fillet and using the, the collars and, and uh, you know, I know that uh, the head of the, the tuna is also a very popular, uh, food item in, in Fiji, and I, I've certainly had my own share of, of fish head soup. Um, so finding uh, uses for different parts of the fish to make kokonda or uh, poke uh, and other products is, is a good way to, to help ensure that you're supporting uh, sustainable fisheries as, as well as not su uh, supporting overfishing uh, by using uh, in, in maximizing the use of, of the seafood that you're eating. And so I really want to uh, thank uh, the uh, embassy and, and this program for inviting me to, to come and speak today. Um, I would certainly be happy to, to entertain any questions. And uh, again, really am honored and, and privileged to be able to come to you and talk about um, why it's important for all of us to work together to address the issues of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and the, the contribution that it makes to overfishing. Because at the end of the day, we all want to live in a world and an environment uh, where we can uh, you know, be happy and healthy and ensure that our environment is protected in a way that our children and our children's children and our children's children's children can benefit. Uh, from the same experience that we've had in a healthy and productive uh, fishery and, and water environment. Um, so again, thank you very much. I really sincerely appreciate your time and um, uh, certainly look forward to doing this again in the future whenever possible. Thank you very, very much, Bubba, for your great presentation. And um, it'll certainly spark a good conversation about what we can do here to stop overfishing, to help combat IUU fishing. So thank you very, very much for your time and have a wonderful day. Thank you.